Welcome to our show, Conversations with Lourdes. Today we have Pearl Danette Glamines, wife of the late Russell Means, here as our honored guest, and we are pleased to introduce her. Thank you, Pearl, again. Thank you, Lourdes. And uh, we are going to continue um, with speaking about the works that um, Russell envisioned. Pearl, um, let's speak t today about some of the works that Russell envisioned. Um, I know you are promoting his books. And also, can you um, speak to us about the documentary that um, is being worked on as we speak? I'd love to. I'm really passionate about this project. It's uh, very ambitious. It is the Russell Means documentary. And the working title is Thunder on the Plains. And what we are doing now is gathering interviews, key interviews, uh, with people who had a relationship with Russell. And the thing about Russell Means is he had never been on vacation. He had traveled five continents, never on a vacation. His work was his life, it was his love, and it encompassed so many different areas that I'm enjoying pulling it all together, connecting the dots, because we have the, uh, the young Russell Means, the athlete, we have the uh, radical, we have the militant, young militant, we have the, uh, the American Indian Movement leader, we have the, one of the founders and permanent trustees of the American Indian Treaty Council that laid the groundwork in the international community for us to have a voice. And that later led to having an indigenous uh, Nobel Peace Laureate, Regoberta Menchu. She speaks very fondly and openly of her relationship with Russell and the American Indian Movement and credits them for the uh, successes that she has enjoyed. We also now have a, an indigenous president, uh, Evo Morales, in Bolivia. And all of that, as I see it, directly came from the work that Russell had done in Geneva at the UN, um, creating that, that voice. So I want to include the political aspect of his life, uh, the arts. Michael Mann recognized his, his talent and his ability. He enjoyed over 32 uh, films within his lifetime. And he also, few people know this, but he was an artist. He used acrylic on canvas, on uh, natural bark, did a very fine um, series of portraits that he called the Indian Killer Series. These are 12 portraits he did in charcoal on indigenous South American bark paper and he did narratives as to who they really were. And from that, Bayer Johnson, his writing partner, and I are going to, to put that in book form as well and publish that. Uh, thank you. Um, I know when I read uh, the book, Where White Man Fears to Tread, um, Russell spoke about his anger. Um, and I know you mentioned something about the, the place that anger has in the life of indigenous people. Can you please um, clarify that? We, we carry what's termed historical grief. We may not have experienced it, but our parents did, our grandparents, and on back. Um, when you think about our history, once we were placed on reservation systems and our children, the government and the uh, churches went in and took our children at the age of five, six years old 
remove them from the family unit, place them in these boarding schools where there's case after case, there's lawsuit after lawsuit, and our relatives to the north, the uh, First Nations people from Canada, they have spearheaded these lawsuits with both the, the, uh, the country and the churches. But the level of abuse, we're talking physical, emotional, mental, sexual, there's massive graves of, these, of children that were murdered, that were killed, insufficient diets, you name it, every type of abuse. Our ancestors suffered and many lost their lives during this process. So we're carrying that. I didn't go to a boarding school, but my mother did. So that disconnect with the family, the nurturing, the, um, the type of discipline that's considered abuse today was going on. So yes, there's a lot of anger. Russell's anger was, it stemmed from not only the historical grief, but his immense love for our people. And to look around and to see that this was continuing in the latter part of the 20th century. In fact, a quote I remember him saying one time during an interview was, um, a spiritual person has to get angry at the injustices. And that was, that really spoke to, to his position. What do you do? How do you go about changing this? Well, you need to bring greater awareness, you need to educate, you need to enforce your rights. And so through the early years of the American Indian Movement, Russell had this vehicle to channel this anger in a very productive way. Um, AIM was a vanguard. They got in the face of the United States government. They held their feet to the fire. They brought to the forefront our treaties and what those contracts, those compacts um, gave us. So this was a very effective time. It was a very exciting time. It was a very tumultuous time where uh, the leadership and the American Indian Movement were risking their freedom and or life to begin to make changes, to begin knocking down those doors, to create a seat at the table of nations. These were some of the things that the elders had charged Russell and, uh, and his contemporaries with, was to creating these, the, the, the recognition and the ability to have a voice, because we had essentially been voiceless for so long. So uh, Russell was able to be very effective. He came from a place of, of honesty. He came from a place of no fear. He came from a place of powerful truths. And it was the the interaction and the counseling that he had received from these elders who had never been to a government school. So they were thinking still in a very free, lucid manner. They were still connecting their heart with their brain. And they, they shared with Russell many of these wisdoms and uh, these responsibilities. And he was able to focus and uh, continue that. It's, it's now uh, his body of, of his, his life work, his legacy, is, is what we're left with. Do you think that it's possible to still form that kind of connection of the heart-mind as the elders did? Is that something that can be passed on through Russell's legacy? Well. I think Russell's legacy is we don't necessarily need a leader, an icon. We need to 
become empowered individually. And like attracts like. It's the domino effect. Russell spoke for those of us that didn't have a voice. We all have a voice today. So we all have some responsibility. And that's all we have to take is our personal responsibility. And if each one of us did that, we could change the world. Very true. Um, what do you believe Russell um, envisioned for the world? He envisioned um, a beautiful world where we could respect one another's visions. We didn't have to agree. We're all different. But we, if we can start respecting other people's visions and the rights that they have, what a beautiful world. What a beautiful world that would be. And that's all he was ever asking, is the, the right to be who we are, to be acknowledged as human beings, just to be acknowledged. Um, it takes a man of great strength, I believe, or a person, man or woman, um, to achieve what he achieved. And um, we have here um, his book, If You Have Forgotten the Names of the Clouds, You've Lost Your Way, and then Where White Man Fears to Tread. Um, what inspired him to write um, as he did? Well, his autobiography, uh, Where White Men Fear to Tread, he was being interviewed. And when they realized trying to get just a biography of his life was impossible, they recognized the need for something larger, which would be um, his life which is a, a story of a contemporary American Indian who happened to be a leader of the American Indian movement. But through his life and his experience, experiences, he was able to share with us our contemporary history. And in fact, it's, it's probably the only book that really speaks to our indigenous history in a contemporary setting. So, and it's been um, widely used throughout universities. He's toured, he's lectured um, in about, I'm going to say, four continents. Um, I, I can't even begin to count the number of universities, but it encompasses everything from indigenous studies, Indian studies, ethnic studies, philosophy, uh, literature, the arts, history. Russell was a real history buff. And in fact, his co-writer, Marvin Wolf, had to go back and verify and validate all of these dates because there are so many historical dates in the, in the book. And Russell had just 100% recall every one of his dates were spot on. Um, and in fact, in his earlier years, he, I, he had thought about going into history. So he just had a love for history. So um, this is on its 18th printing. It was published in 1995. So the word is still getting out there. And uh, he's enjoyed a, a great deal of success with it. The last uh, book, if you've forgotten the names of the clouds, you've lost your way. It was um, Russell's desire to say to his people, we're losing our language. When the average speaker is 65 years of age and the average life expectancy for the Lakota male is 43 and a half years, and the female 52 years, the language is all but gone. So that was, he was very passionate about that, was um, through total immersion education, 
tailored after what the Maoris had successfully done in reclaiming their language. And now it's a second language in New Zealand. So that was a, a, a powerful uh, role model. It, it uh, is being implemented now in uh, Lakota country. Thank you. Standing there. This is Russell's epilogue. In the 1960s, an elder Denny man from the Northwest Territories of Canada stated to an anthropologist who was intent on civilizing the Denny people, quote, you white people are very arrogant. You think you're responsible for the extinction of different forms of life. Have you ever considered that maybe those life forms didn't want to live with you? The Kogi Indians of South America live high on an 18,000 foot mountain on the edge of the Caribbean Sea. They have preserved their culture intact since before the arrival of the conquistadores in the lowlands below their mountain. Their society is run by priests called mamas who are trained from birth to assume the spiritual and political leadership of a people who call themselves the Big Brothers. All patriarchal societies of the world are referred to by the Kogi Little Brothers. The Kogi believe that the earth is a living being and that the mountain on which they live is a bellwether of the health of the earth. It is the duty of the Kogi Mamas through deep meditation and the preservation of certain sacred sites to keep the earth in balance and maintain her health. For centuries before the invasion of the Spanish, and for all the centuries since, the Kogi have managed to maintain the health and vigor of the earth on which we all depend for survival. Lately, however, things have begun to change for the worse. Species have died off or disappeared from their mountain home. The water cycle is disrupted and avocado trees and other plants have withered and died. Avalanches have wrecked carnage. The mountain is dying and with it the earth. Recently, the Kogi, who have long been reclusive and avoided contact with the little brothers, have descended from the mountain to spread the warning to all people. They have even established a website to make sure that their message is heard loud and clear by all people around the world. The activities of the Little Brothers have become too destructive. The Kogi can no longer keep the earth healthy on their own. The earth is dying, and to save it, the Big Brothers need the help of the Little Brothers. It is still not too late. The living earth can be saved, and with her, the lives of all of us who depend on her. But the Little Brothers will have to change their way of living on the earth. Otherwise, say the Kogi, their holy mountain will die, and the little brothers will bring upon us all the end of life on earth. In the words of Chief Seattle, nation follows nation like the waves of the sea. It is the order of nature, and regret is useless. Your time of decay may be distant, but it will surely come. For even the white man, whose God walked and talked with him as a friend to friend, cannot escape our common destiny. We may be brothers after all. We shall see. Thank you for your attention, and thank you for purchasing the book. If you have any questions that Bayard or I might be able to answer, we'd be happy to do so. Thank you. kind of covered some of this, but for you personally, what do you want to have come from the release of this book, and from the people that buy it? What do you want the result to be? Well, for starters, I'd like the ranking above Aristotle. <laughs> 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 what I would really like to see, and we're in the process, we have three um, doctors, the the academic world where we're getting three academic reviews I would love to see this as a text in um, higher education I'd like to see it at all levels and it was 
written in a in a way that all ages um, and all walks of life can <clears throat> grasp. So that would be my um, my desire is to see it as an educational tool. Philosophy, indigenous studies, ethnic studies, literature. It's applicable to many, many areas. And I and I publicly would like to thank Bayard for being available, being a good friend to my husband for over 20 years and and for making the time when his health was challenged to to do this and every day I'm grateful every time I pick up the book I'm grateful to Bayard for being there and showing up and doing this well I uh, <coughs> the book kind of brought me back alive I was, uh, had a gruff haul there for a while but the uh, the thing that um, in answer to your question, I, I directed at both of us, I guess. Yes. I remember the first Earth Day in 1970, and, and Silent Spring had come out. It seemed like people knew what was going on. I mean, I remember the early 70s hearing about the ozone layer and all that. It seemed like things were on the right track. People were getting a clue. And all through the early part of the 70s, things were changing. When the things were changing, you know, people were more aware of, of uh, ecology and you started to hear all these words and then through the 80s Reagan wham you know, another Reagan boom Bush pow, you know <laughs> beat down you know it's like reeling backwards you know more gas more you know raise the speed limits everything was going backwards it was like the world was upside down it was insane and as I went around the world I spent a lot of time in Alaska Africa and, and places where there where I began to perceive that the that the world wasn't as we had been told that the real war of the worlds wasn't about which European or European derivative power would dominate and rape the rest of the world. What was the war of the worlds was really about the industrialized world destroying the natural world. It had been going on for several thousand years. And so this, this had been troubling me for decades. And when I met Russell and I realized that there was an entire, <coughs> it was the first time that I realized that there was an existing natural world. And that if you travel across the world, you see that civilization is like a spreading fungus mold. But it's still, you know, as much as 80% of the Amazon jungle is still there. Nature still rules the world. When I went to Africa, I realized nature's winning here. Mm -hmm. You tired of bring your cows in where the tetsi fly is? You're finished. You know, reeling back into some area where you can, where humans can kind of survive. I realized this war was going on. And when Russell and I started talking about this book and the belief system, over the 20 years of knowing each other, I realized there was an entire belief system that represented that nature, you know, that was the, the value system that we all, all of us, wherever we come from, the Europeans were indigenous before they were conquered by alien patriarchal powers and so something like 50 million women were murdered in the, in the takeover of, of, of Europe by pat patriarchy. Uh, it was a lot of those are matriarchal societies as well. So what I hope to accomplish is pretty grandiose, but I want nature to win. And I think that it's important that, that, that this belief system, as much of it that we could put into a small book and intact, and, and that as much as we could implement with the abilities that we had at the time, and, and you know, through this, this form of media, that we could, we could get the belief system that underlies the natural world's point of view. Because all we ever hear about you know, is the other side. You know, if you're, you hear about, <clears throat> you know, from the mainstream press, you can't even get a straight story on what the Occupy people wanted. Right, that's right. Oh, they don't know what they want. Well, yes, they do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is only, C only CNN didn't know what they wanted. No. If you read anywhere besides CNN, you knew what they wanted. They were stating very clearly what they wanted. Well, it's all about lies and deception. And I just thought, with Russell, you know, he was a guy that I met who didn't care personal consequences. He was going to tell the truth. He was going to do what he believed was right regardless of what was done to him. He didn't care if they, he was shot, killed. At one point there were 10 cops ready to shoot him if he didn't put his hands above his head. He said, I'm not putting my hands above my head. Mother, I'm coming home. And he, when he found out he had cancer, and he, he said, uh, he came over to the house on Friday. And he said, on Monday I'm going in to find out 
my ETA to the spirit world. Just like that. And I thought, this is, this is the guy I want to go down in history with. And this is the belief system I want to be on the side of. Pearl, what else is happening in the life of Pearl Means in continuation with the vision that Russell had? Thank you, Lourdes. Well, as you know, in our culture, four is a sacred number. Russell made his transition to the next world October 22nd of 2012. So the family, we decided we would have four separate honorings that would give our people, Indian country, and the outside world an opportunity to come and pay their respects. So we've already completed two honorings. The third will be taking place on June 13th, 2013, at the conclusion of his annual Sundance in the Lakota Holy Land, the Black Hills in South Dakota. So that'll be on the 13th of June. And then the fourth and final will be on his birthday, November 10th, 2013, and it'll be in Denver, Colorado. And that will be a, a beautiful uh, four-day event. It'll be a two-day academic symposium, political um, type of symposium that'll be organized. And then we'll also have his art, an art show. It coincides with the Denver International Film Fest, and they've offered us a day, so we'll get to see some of his work. We'll have a fundraising dinner uh, that will go toward the endowment of his Russell Means Library. And then on the fourth day, which would be November 10th in Denver, Colorado, we are securing the facility within the next 10 days, and that will be publicized on websites, Indian country media, etc. And that will be open to the public. So people will be able to fly in from all over the country and uh, pay their respects, and that will be a very beautiful way to, to finalize the, the, the four honorings. But with regard to the Russell Means Library, I have just begun working with a young, creative, brilliant architect. And it's my desire, and I'm um, networking now, because this is, again, another ambitious project. I'll need to raise quite a bit of money in order to construct and to uh, curate this library. It'll house historic information of the Lakota, and then up to the activism days, the political days, the educational days, the um, artistic uh, projects that Russell was involved with. It'll house his body of work, his lifetime, over 40 years of work for the people. Thank you, Pearl. Um, it has been a pleasure having you as our special guest and the, continu the continuation of Russell's work, uh, it will go on for generations. We welcome the opportunity uh, of having you here and we look forward to having you here as our guest again. Thank you, Lourdes. My pleasure. <laughs>